Jillian, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Doug. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. It's great to see you. Um, and I want to get right into it. So you posted this quote last night on your no Instagram time to page. Waste. <laughs> no time Sorry. to waste. And your quote says this, some of the biggest lessons and revelations I've had over the last 10 years regarding self-esteem, communication, and love. And these lessons were, don't chase, ask them where you stand and accept their answer. Don't accept crumbs, ask for more of what you want. If they can't give at the level you give, walk. Let whoever wants to leave, leave. But don't be afraid to be honest and tell them you don't want them to leave. Letting go is hard, but nothing is harder on our minds and bodies than clinging. Letting go is hard, but trying to convince someone to choose you is harder. Which of those lessons and revelations has been most meaningful to you in your own personal growth and growth with relationships? I mean, all of it. I think that when I reflect back on my life, um, starting from when I actually started dating and being in relationship, right? And I started young. I started being in relationships when I was 15 years old. I had my first real relationship. I mean, real, I put that in the air quotes, but you know, it was like my first love. So I help people in all different stages of their relationship. But one of the things that I see, and I see this in men too, and especially because I work with a lot of younger millennial men, but more so in women, the things that I see the most is um, low self-esteem. And part of that is also societal conditioning that has been telling women for decades and decades and decades and longer than that, that she has to be chosen. She has to be the one who's chosen. And that's why you'll see a lot of women and girls who will compete with each other for the prize, the prize being this particular you know, person, man or woman, boy or girl. And as a result, what a lot of women will do is, and I've seen this and I saw this in myself when I was much younger, is sort of chase the love of someone. And that is because, well, for one, I think that in general, women really, I think men value love, but women, we've been so conditioned to believe that there's a gaping hole in our souls and hearts if we're not loved by someone romantically. And when our thirst, when our hunger for love is stronger than our self-love or stronger than our standards, we end up not only in situations where we betray ourselves, but we end up pushing people away. So when it comes to me personally, you know, when I was going through my divorce, I mean, I was very vulnerable in the fact that I didn't want the divorce, even though, and this could be a whole other conversation, I think deep down, no, I know deep down I wanted it. And I think a lot of people, when they feel like they're being abandoned by someone, they're unconscious as wanting the end of that relationship, but they were just too afraid of the consequences of the end of the relationship, which is being alone, starting all over again, women thinking that they're not good enough, women thinking that, that maybe they're getting too old, they're biological clock. So there's a lot of things that factor into this. But ultimately, I let him leave. I didn't fight. Like there's lots of people who will fight a, a divorce, you know, like they'll fight. I'm not going to give you a divorce or something like that. I'm not going to let you break up with me. No, no, no. Like one of the most powerful lessons I learned is if someone can walk away from you, just let them walk, let them go. But you can be vulnerable and say, I don't want this. But ultimately the price of convincing someone to stay in a relationship with you is a really hefty price. You hold them hostage emotionally and you know that and they know that and you will never feel secure in that relationship. And by the way, if it works, it works for a, a small amount of time. And so what I've come to understand and learn through my own experience and through working with people now for over 20 years, because I would work with people just in their bodies when I was teaching yoga and they would talk to me about these things, is that there's a much smaller percentage that I'm personally comfortable with of people who actually know their value. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't sometimes act like a little in a relationship, <laughs> right? That doesn't mean that they don't sometimes you know, make mistakes. It doesn't mean that they're flawless. It doesn't mean that they're perfect but they don't actually really know their value. And so they're thirsty for someone to choose them and to love them. And that's why they'll stay in these, you know, the, the popular term is these situationships. Now, I'm not someone who really actually stayed in situationships 
But I definitely, I didn't communicate. I didn't advocate for myself. I was more, I, I was more like, let's keep the peace. Let me act like the cool girl. Let me do this so that I wouldn't lose someone. I would make a guy so important. And I think that that's a really big mistake. It's one thing to make your partner really important. It's another thing to make someone who hasn't chosen you, you haven't chosen them, you don't know very well, that important. So it's all personal. And it's also what I've seen. Why do you think that you put so much emphasis on loving other guys instead of like loving yourself? Because that's what girls are taught. Mm. I mean, and I'm not saying that men don't do this too, but the, the vast majority of girls, young girls, you'll see girls completely divorce themselves from their, from their peer group for, you know, a boy. And now, you know, for a girl or for, for a love interest, let's say, and we're taught from a very young age to value that more. I also think that part of it is also that, you know, I had a very, very strong mother, but where she, where her spiritual work was really when it came to relationships with men. And what was modeled to me was her really not feeling totally empowered when it came to her relationships with men. So I saw that. And then, you know, I mean, there could be a number of things. I had a very complicated relationship with my father. And I think that certainly therapists, and it wouldn't be wrong, but this is just a one, I think, piece of the pie. I don't think it's the whole pie because we have lots of conditioning that's not just familial, but the conditioning, you know, was, well, you know, the, the, the analysis would be, well, I didn't have the love from dad. So let me try to get the love from these boys. But I've also had really lovely relationships where that wasn't at play at all. But let's just remove gender from this to chase anyone. You know, what is it, what does it imply to chase someone? If you're chasing anything, that thing that you're chasing, that person, place, or thing is actually running away from you. They're repelled by you. They don't want to get caught by you. If you're a person who likes to pursue, pursuing is very different. Pursuing is a dance. There's a dance between the pursuer and the pursued, and they're feeding each other, and it's incredibly sexy, and it's incredibly fun. When you're chasing someone, you're crossing boundaries, you're making, you're giving the other person the, sort of like an icky feeling, and you're completely ungrounded. You're thirsty, you're hungry, you're desperate. And I think part of what inspired me to write that post is two things. One is get in touch with your desperation when it comes to love, because that doesn't make you a bad person. It's really, really common, but it's something that we have to kind of mitigate and, and, and really work with so that we're not acting from places of, of desperation and that we're not. And if we are feeling desperate to figure out why, number two, learn to let go. Always learn to let go because I'd, it's better to grieve someone than to live with the intense anxiety that is guaranteed if you're convincing someone to stay or you're staying in a quote unquote relationship where someone is totally actually not that into you, but is, but is hanging out with you because, excuse me, because, you know, it's convenient. So, yeah. There's so much, there's so many different ways we could go with that. You, you mentioned, conditioning, you mentioned patterns, you mentioned some of your own um, relationship history. What made you change? Like, was there a moment in your life where you were like, this is, this is it. I'm done. I need to like work this out. And, and despite what society tells me to do, despite what my family showed me to do, like what forced you to change? Well, first, like I said before, I've been in really lovely relationships. And, you know, one of the longest relationships of my life was in my 20s, and it was a very secure relationship. So none of these dynamics are being played out there at all. So I think that who you choose matters. And I always say that. And I also think that we go through, I think context matters. I think that particularly for a woman, and especially this was true for me, it's like once I reached like my 30s, there's the pressure of, oh, I'm supposed to get married. Oh, I, you know, want to have a family. And, you know, oh, I'm getting old. I mean, how pathetic is it that we live? Because this is not happening in most of Europe. This is happening in this country where women wake up at 30 and think that they're old. That 
is so sad and pathetic to me. It's just sad. And it's not pathetic of the women. It's pathetic of our society, honestly. So I was living with that. So I, so I would say that I had these, I wouldn't say toxic, uh, you know, I had, I had one very toxic relationship when I was 29. And then I would say my thirties, I was just sort of settling. I wouldn't say toxic, but just settling. And then of course there was my marriage. The change really came with when you go through a divorce and you go through the death of a parent, especially a parent that with whom you were very close and I was very close with my mom, it changes you, you know, it wakes you up, it changes you. Then that's when I really started transitioning from yoga teaching to doing the work that I do now. Most of my life, I had a blueprint, which was... I'm going to get married one day and have kids. That's just what I thought was going to happen. That's what, when you're young, that's what you think. Nowhere in my blueprint was there, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be a teacher. I started teaching yoga. I loved it. Then I hit the, the ceiling, which is very low in yoga teaching. And I was like, didn't really know what I was going to do. And then I got married. And then the expectation was like, I'm going to have you know babies with this person and be someone's wife and teach yoga. Inside of that, what was really happening was a young woman who was not actually reaching her potential. And I think that we talk about potential a lot in the conversation around historically around men, but women have potential too that they need to reach. Everyone's potential is different. What my potential is, not what your potential is. You know, everyone's purpose is different. Some people, their purpose is to, is to be a parent. Maybe their purpose is whatever it is to live on a farm. Maybe it's their purpose is to be a CEO, whatever it is. But people need passions. They need purpose. That purpose, like I said, does not have to be in the form of a career and achievement because that's very much the model that you know, as Americans we've grown up in. It's very much the model that most men have grown up in and now more women are starting to adopt. That's not what I'm talking about, but we need sort of passions. And yes, yoga was always my passion, but teaching it was a ceiling and I didn't know where to go with that. And I think that left me in a state of feeling very much like I was just chronically like that. I started to become this person who had all this potential and passion that was untapped. And so going through the divorce and the, and the death of my mother woke me up and, and pushed me onto this path where I had to reach deep within myself and tap into my potential. And when I started to tap into my potential, my self-esteem was going up and up and up and up and up and my self-confidence up and up and up. Plus, that's the beauty of getting older. I'm getting older and older and older. And like, you know, we all know that things about getting older, but the great things about older is that you stop caring so much about what other people think and you start feeling more comfortable, even though your skin might be not as like firm as it once was, it becomes a more comfortable skin to reside in. The tipping point was the day I, the old me died when my husband left and my mom was dying of lung cancer. But then it's what happened afterwards that I started to tap into what was really important to me, I started to find myself. And that's what changed. You mentioned finding yourself. You mentioned tapping into your full potential. You mentioned letting go of old dreams, an old version of yourself. You mentioned grief and dealing with the loss of your mom. And you mentioned how all of this sparked this transformation and rebirth of, of Jillian. What was that process like? Like, like was what kind, what kind of things did you do to help yourself, like rediscover yourself, tap, like tap into what your potential was and rebuild your self-esteem and self-confidence? It looked like, I mean, I had a lot of mentors. I had a lot of help. You know, I was very much inspired by Tony Robbins. That really helped me. I got really obsessed with what makes a relationship thrive and like obsessed because the death of my mother would be the biggest impact would become what the biggest impact that I've ever experienced spiritually and emotionally in my life. But the end of my relate, my marriage really was like, 
oh, it was so scary to me. It was so scary to me that that didn't work out. It was such a, it was like a, such a hard smack on the face. And I was like, what the, what is it? What makes a relationship really thrive? Like, what is it? And so I went into a very obsessive, deep journey into that, enrolling in school for coaching, getting myself my mentors that I speak to every week and have been speaking to every week for the last 10 years of my life or nine and a half years of my life. It was, it was doing all that. And I, by the way, you know, I don't want people to think like that's what they have to do. You know, for some people, it might be that they like, it could be a completely, everyone's path is different. But clearly it was like, I was meant to teach something. I was meant to take everything that I've learned through studying uh, yoga for the past 26 years and transmute it into something like what I'm doing now. Yeah. It seems what was really important for you was to accept that a lot of that was painful and in many ways unfair, right? The, yes. you know, the death of your mom, somebody getting divorced from somebody that you thought you would spend a good bit of time with or the rest of your life with, um, you know, letting go of that dream and then rebuilding yourself is, is very challenging. And then finding the connecting the dots in whatever way worked best for you. Yeah, it certainly makes sense. It's also very messy. I just, I don't want people to think that like, you know, change and, and growth is can feel like dying. So it was very, very messy with steps forward, steps back, steps forward, steps back, um, depression, anxiety, fear. I mean, excitement, inspiration. I mean, all of it. What was your level of trust like with yourself and other people after the divorce and after your mom passed away? And how did you, you know, transform that? When my husband left, I went through something that was very new to me, which is that every male I looked at on the street, I feared. And I, and I saw as the enemy. And I couldn't, I was like, oh my God, I can't be that woman. <laughs> I got to fix this. It was very healing for me to have, uh, the two mentors who I work with are, are, are women, but it was very healing for me to listen to some of the mentors that I've explained and some of the personal development people who were men because it kind of restored my faith in men. I also went to some live events where I met like amazing men who were married, there with their wives, not hitting on me, being kind, making me feel safe, feeling supportive. So that was really good. Yeah, I just started to, that started to heal and I started to restore that. I think that, you know, most of my life, I've been a pretty fearful person. Like I'm afraid of a lot of things, but I push myself to do the thing that I'm afraid of anyway. And so I think that builds inside of me a, a courage muscle, a resilience muscle. And so I don't know if I had real faith in myself. Maybe that is a faith in myself that I didn't realize. But at the end of the day, I was just driven Initially, I was driven to get out of pain. I would do anything to get out of pain and putting and putting all the focus back into me and my potential was the thing that got me out of pain. What was repl what replaced the drive to get out of my own personal pain was the motivation to help others get out of their pain. I think one of the biggest um, levers of pain for people is something very similar to what you describe in that rejection by one means rejection for all, meaning that you you feared, you talked about how you feared men. They were the enemy because of what happened with your ex-husband. And I think a lot of people, whether it's male or male or female, if somebody, for instance, cheats on them, they then assume that every other person they get into a relationship with is going to cheat on them or break up with them or fill in the blank, right? What was more effective for you in shifting your perspective with that narrative? Was it going out and dating men, like a bunch of men, not like having multiple partners, but I mean, just dating a bunch just to see, okay, like that person's not a jerk. That person's not necessarily going to break up with me. Or was it just some in intense amount of therapy to be able to unlearn some sort of thought process or none of the above? Okay. So kind of none of the above. So I was in therapy when it hit the fan initially. And I forget how long I was in therapy for, but I, I don't know, maybe six months, but then I stopped. 
because I just, therapy for me personally is something to do when in an emergency situation. And then I feel like I've got other tools that I like to rely on because therapy very quickly for me becomes a rehashing of the same old things. And when I start to feel like, oh God, I don't want to sit on the couch and talk about this anymore. That's when I know it's time to stop. I can't, I, I can credit therapy for sure as helping me have the support that I needed to get through the, the initial, the acute phase of the crisis, but I can't credit therapy for anything beyond that. That's just my personal experience. I didn't date. No, I took a major, major time out. I think that healing that was just, just my own personal healing, my own personal healing, going to these events, um, more having friendships with men, uh, hanging out. I made it a point to hang out with my friends who were really in good relationships with good men and spend time with them. And then also to just heal from the pain of my marriage. And then, and then that's what started to kind of, then it started to dissipate. And as far as coaching the people that you coach now, when somebody is in that, that type of rut where they're assuming that just because somebody does something to them that everybody else is going to treat them the same way. Do you encourage, do you encourage them to um, have like some, some form of exposure therapy where they're going out and hanging out with different types, you know, type people, um, whether it's, you know, male or female, they're hanging, hanging out with those types of people that they might be romantically interested in just to prove to themselves that not everybody's a jerk. Do you encourage them to go to therapy? Like what's the, what's the common solution? It depends. So like, certainly if there's like, you know, a trauma, like a divorce or any sort of abuse, and then you're really just not trusting that gender, the exposure therapy is start talking to the old, if it's a man, start talking to the old man who runs the coffee shop on your corner and start talking to him and and making friends with him. It's not dating because I don't think you're ready to date if that's how you feel. It's about like exactly what I did, like listen, you know, read the biography of a really amazing, we're just talking about men right now, just because, you know, that's what I was dealing with, but read the biography of a really amazing man, you know, and just to learn about it, study male psychology so that you understand that, like, that there's some differences there. That's certainly what I did. Hang out with your, with safe men in your family or friends of family. Spend time with, you know, men who will never, ever, ever hit on you ever and that they're just safe. So that's the exposure therapy that I really recommend. Friendships. Friendships. I think it's important to develop, especially for the very emotionally fragile who have been really traumatized by a relationship. And let's say it's a woman traumatized by a relationship with a man. I don't think she should be dating and going out and whatnot. I think what she should be doing is going really slow and developing a very strong friendship with a man. And and maybe, and hopefully that might lead into a relationship, but I, my, my recommendation, no, it's not therapy because you can work with me with that unless the trauma is really severe, become friends with someone first. Very, 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 very effective, by the way, extremely effective. Yeah, I bet just being able to expose yourself to some level of relationship again that doesn't have to be like romantic, just have be platonic to just be able to prove that whatever gender you were fearful of or afraid of or didn't trust that they're not going to hurt you. That there's good men out there. There's good women out there. They exist. There's great people. And I you have to remove all the romantic and attraction stuff because that makes things very messy. But they have to be exposed to really good people. In a safe environment, yeah. And speaking of the attraction stuff and the messy stuff and kind of tying in some of the stuff that you shared earlier, one of the other, I think, traps that you you mentioned you fell into and a lot of other people fall into is that they just, they put that person on a pedestal, like from the very beginning, they become obsessive uh, about that potential partner and they end up losing sight of themselves. They end up losing sight of if that's the right person for them. And I know we can't change how like our body responds when it comes to romance and attraction, but I'm sure we can 
change how we prepare to enter into a situation like that. So what were some of the things that you've personally done to help yourself better prepare for when you are you know, dating somebody so that you don't become um, overly obsessed? Okay. So I'm going to look at it from both perspectives. First of all, the, the biggest problem about being on a pedestal, and if we're speaking personally, the problems that I have run into more frequently than not is being, I'm the one who's put on a pedestal. So the problem with being put on a pedestal is you will inevitably, without question sooner or later, become the fallen hero. If someone's idealizing you, once they actually get to know you and, and their idealized projection of you, which is their issue, gets shattered because you're a real person with flaws, you become, you become the fallen hero. All that, you fall off the pedestal. And I think that people feed into this because when we're put on a pedestal, we like it. It feels good initially. It boosts our ego. We feel attractive. We're like into it. Even though there might be a part of us inside that's like, oh, maybe like, you know, I hope they really love me for when I, you know, for, for who I really am. And I see this all the time. It's like, okay, then, then, then relationship gets real. Your flaws come out. And then all of a sudden you are just not that important anymore. So you don't want to put anyone on a pedestal because that, because they're going to become the fallen hero in your eyes. And you never want to be put on a pedestal because you are going to be the fallen hero in your eyes. I think it's really important to be very upfront about your weaknesses and about the things that you struggle with. I don't, this is not date one. This is like when things are starting to become more intimate emotionally and you're getting closer and it's like things are moving forward. It's like, hey, these are the things that I struggle with. This is the person I'm trying to become. This is the person I'm committed to becoming. This is the woman. This is the man who I want to become. But once in a while, these demons might come out because I'm still working on this and it's still really hard. And that's me. And that's what people need to do. They have to be really more honest with the things that they are struggling with, especially if they're sensing that someone is idealizing them or projecting in any way. Because we do that. We project the ideal. That's what, a lo- that's what love bombing is all about. If you feel like being love bombed is literally someone taking all their childlike fantasies and projections, their, their, you know, what they saw in a movie, what they saw from parents, what they saw in society. And they're just like, you are it. You are perfect. If you, if you're in a relationship or you're seeing someone and you're starting to sense that, I I think you should be very, very direct. I think you should be like, this is what I struggle with. By the way, I had diarrhea the other day. Like, I think you should be really, really, really dry because you don't want to be with someone who doesn't want real. Not that you should be talking about your feces necessarily. It's, I'm using that more as just like, you know, a fun example, but you had to be really real. So how can somebody know the difference, whether they're being like love bombed or they're the person is just real, is interested in them and just being kind? Because I know for me, like, when I start to like somebody, I'm a coach, I'm a trainer, right? So I'm used to like complimenting people, giving people high fives and, you know, trying to lift people up. And that's just in my natural. And I think that's a great thing. Don't change it. Don't change it. Right. That's a wonderful thing. I, no, I, it's, in the beginning, if someone is pursuing you and liking you, they are going to be a little googly eyed and that's fine. I think that's nice. I think the love bombing is more just like, you know, week one, I think I'm in love with you. I want to take you on this amazing trip. Let's go on this amazing trip and like, I'm going to pay for every, all all that is just way too quick. And that's when you're, when you have to just say, okay, if you're saying to yourself, why did they feel that strongly about me so soon? That's when you have to question that person's intentions. And I think it's, it's, yeah, that that, that makes sense. Like if they're like almost like a, like a super fan of you, right. And they're wanting to like drop everything that they're doing to, come, come meet you at any, anytime, anywhere. They're looking to take you out, pay for everything, take you on all these trips. They're like telling you that <laughs> there's like, here's a, like a common thing. Like you're, you guys are soulmates, like all this stuff. Like, well, that's, I mean, if anyone just said that, if someone said that to me, I'm soulmates, like, and I barely knew them. I mean, <laughs> I would never see that person again. 
That'd be such a turnoff to me. And it should be a turnoff to people, actually. Because, you know, you don't really know a person, but it's also fun to be really excited about someone in the beginning and to be really into them. And that's great. I think it's more about being grounded in the fact that like, okay, this is the stage we're in. It's exciting. It's new. You know, we're, we're in lust. Let's enjoy it for what it is, but let's not confuse that with love or let's not confuse that with a relationship. And so I guess like we've kind of flipped the script, the script a little bit, um, but maybe like taking this one step further, how can somebody genuinely show interest? I know it's going to be different for everybody where they're like, how can they show that they're actually, they actually like somebody with, like I mentioned, complimenting them and being available to them and asking them questions without, you know, coming on too strong. I'd love to take you out. You're so interesting. You're 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 super beautiful. You're you're super good looking. I find you really attractive and I find you very interesting. I want to get to know you better. Like you're so cool. You're so cute. I mean all those things are nice. I find you really interesting is a good one. So we talked about removing gender. Um and I think that's obvious that's important because I think this obviously happens in in both scenarios, right? With a yes. man and a woman, you know, it happens both. And same sex both. relationships, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It, ha- it happens with, you know, same sex relationships. It happens with heterosexual relationships. So I think that one of the things though I wanted to ask just from your own personal experience is you mentioned, I don't know if, if, if you, you talked about coming on too strong with men, but more or less like putting them on a, on a pedestal because like society has said that, you know, women need to do this and women need to do that and be chosen and all these things. Like how can, how can a woman avoid falling into the trap of coming on too strong and and trying to get somebody to pick them and pick them and pick them? It starts with your relationship with yourself and this, and, and, and it's not just women, it's men too. I mean, I've worked with a lot of, you know, men who suffer with low self esteem. Everything starts with your relationship with your, with yourself. When we, Whoever you are, whatever stage of life you're in, like I said, if your hunger to be loved is stronger than your self-love or your standard for yourself, then you are putting yourself at risk for settling, for being in, in a very unhealthy relationships, for tolerating less than you deserve, for staying in something that's really not for you. So you don't fall in the trap because you have, we have to learn that like, yes, it's okay to want a relationship, but at what expense does it mean at the expense of our own mental health? Does it mean at the expense of our own self-respect? So if one is so thirsty for love to the point where they will put themselves in harm's way or betray themselves or settle then the, de- the, 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 the work, so to speak, is understanding where that is coming from and then taking it into action. Well, what is going on in your life? Because context matters that this is happening because understanding where it comes from is important, but it's not actually going to create change. What's going to create change is addressing the parts in your life that needs addressing so that you can feel more whole. And then you're not someone looking around, trying to put, you know, square a peg into a square hole, whatever it is. And you get to be the person who chooses wisely versus like, you know, the desperation of love me, love me, love me, just because I'm attracted to you. What do you tell the person who has done the work to understand where a lot of these um, unhealthy um, tendencies come from, you know, whether it's from childhood, whether it's from past relationships, whether it's from fill in the blank. Societal also, conditioning. Yeah. Societal conditioning. And they've Pressures, also- Pressures, the, hormones. Yes. All of right. it. Right. So yeah. they understand like where, where all these patterns and conditionings come from. And they also, because of the times that we're in, They have access to all this information online for free on relationships, on dating, on love, on connection, on boundaries, on attachment. And they're still overwhelming. Yeah. They're still stuck. Mm -hmm. Why are that? Why are so many people still stuck despite all that? Um, Because, well, 
unless you're actually working with someone who can help you facilitate change, you know, there's only so far that you can get through the free content. The free content's amazing, but there's only so far you can get because it's all individual. I always tell, you know, you look at your life from the perspective of, of your needs. Are you tapping into your potential? Are you, do you have stability in your life? Do you have financial and emotional stability in your life? Or are you looking to a partner to give that to you? Are you living your life so safely that you're not allowing yourself the joy of an adventure? Are you contributing? Do you have community around you? Do you have love and community around you? Do you have support around you? So it's looking at these areas of, of, of our lives to see what's missing. Because the, 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 one of the most important questions we can ask ourselves or ask a client is, so what is missing? And oftentimes when people are in these patterns, there's a lot missing. There's maybe community or there's the sense of fun or they're not tapping into their potential or they don't feel like, like I said, everyone needs purpose and passion, everyone. And again, that does not mean that it has to translate into a career, but everyone needs that. It is not just men. Women need it too. Everyone needs to feel like that their lives have some meaning, that they are able to do something on a daily basis that lights them up. This is essential. It is, it is essential. It's the need of, it's the spiritual need, if you will. And so that's how people then start to change is by looking in the mirror and being like, okay, it doesn't matter anymore what daddy did, what mommy did, what this is happening. What's, what's missing? What, what do I need to work on? What, what needs, you know, and some people, maybe their nervous systems are very dysregulated. So it's about getting, I've worked with people where it's like, okay, you, let's start at, from the bottom physiologically, you're very off. There's too much stress. So let's work on getting your nervous system regulated. Then let's work on, you know, what, what lights you up. And it's not linear. Sometimes we're working on these things all at once, but this is what it is. It's working on the relationship with yourself. How do we begin to change the way we navigate this current dating landscape that we're in? I think with dating apps, people should get off the dating apps. I think that if you're going to be on them, you should be on them for fun. But I don't think I've said this before. People should not rely on the dating apps. I think people should do more things the old fashioned way. That might mean it takes a little bit longer. Um, expand your circle because the more people you meet, the more people they know and can introduce you. So say yes to certain things. Someone wants to ha go get you know coffee with you or a meal with you. Say yes. You never know what's going to happen. They want it. They invite you to an event. All you want to do is stay home. You don't really feel like going out. Blah blah blah. Which is what a lot of people are, especially post COVID. Go to the event. You never know who you're going to meet. There's some sort of business thing. You meet someone through business. Hey, by the way, I'm single. Do you know anyone? Like you just never know. You you take yourself out to a meal with a book. Sit by yourself without any headphones on, little things like that. If, if you've been thinking about going on a trip, go on the damn trip. You never know what's going to happen. It opens up your mind. I think that I, look, everybody wants love and they want money, more money and more love, love, sex, and money. That's what rules the world. At some point, it's like the dating apps, it's like the hunt for it. And it's like this perfect person. And that's, what can I say if that's if if it's all about, you know, obsessing over the algorithm on a dating app and being attractive to people and how many people are going to swipe on you? What can I tell you? You're going to be in the hamster wheel of dating for a really long time. You're doing it all wrong. It's the wrong strategy. And and you're getting seduced by technology in a way that's that's not getting you closer to what it is that you really want. So we've got to turn down all that noise. And a lot of people need to go a little bit more the old fashioned, old fashioned route, like join community. A lot of people who are really want a relationship, not everyone, certainly not saying everyone, but there's a fair amount of people who really want a relationship where if they were to look at their life, like I said, like I mentioned a few minutes prior, holistically, they would see, oh, there's a deficit in community. This, I don't have a lot of community in my life. Well, go find community. Not so easy, but go find it. Join your yoga, 
your yoga center, go to whatever, whatever you're into, take that class, join community. And then number one, you won't be as hungry for love because you will be getting some fulfillment in that area of your life. And number two, you'll be meeting more people and expanding your circle. And the more you expand your circle, the more you put yourself in a position to meet someone who could potentially become your mate. Taking it back to um, the way things used to be, right? Being more old fashioned and getting yeah. out more in person. Or go to a matchmaker. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. matchmakers are the matchmakers are very expensive, so that's not for everyone. Yeah, and honestly, it's like I mean, there's and there's no guarantee that that works too, right? Because yeah, like, no, there isn't. There isn't. No. I I think the the most common thing that I've heard from people is that they they meet somebody out at an event or friends of friends or at church or par, at a park and in a, at the gym, yoga class or. On somewhere the plane, that, at the airport. Yeah. Yeah. Just random places, but in a place where they're out around um, other people. And, and we talked like in our first conversation about like what's important for relationships. Like we talked about like understanding people's past traumas and their past patterns and stuff like that. But I feel like once people get into relationships, that's when, I mean, the real work starts, right? Like once, they, once they've settled in and the lust is gone and it's like, all right, now it's just... You're yeah, here. I mean, you can attract the relation, you can manifest the relationship, but are you going to be able to keep it, sustain yeah. it, maintain it? How do yes, you maintain the real a work relation? begins? How do you maintain a relationship? <laughs> the million dollar question. Listen, <laughs> a long term relationship takes a lot of work. It's not easy to make a relationship last a lifetime or to last, you know, whatever, an adulthood lifetime. It takes a lot of communication, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of compassion. I think that it's really important that uh, two people they need they need to be friends too. Now I know if they go too far the friendship route, then they then they don't want they become like roommates and they don't want to sleep with each other, of course. But you need to actually be friends with the person. And what I mean by that, trust them, enjoy spending time with them, and who you choose matters. You need to choose someone who you can do it for the long haul with. Is like looking back, like obviously in your own life, like, I mean, I guess I, I would imagine you believe that everything happens for a reason that everything that's happened in your past has brought you to where you are today, but knowing what you know now and given all the work that you've done, do you think that with the information you have now, you would have been able to, to, to save any of your past relationships? That's a great question. I've never been asked that before. I think a, a lot of the relationships I never would have gotten into to begin with. I think what I know now, I never would have been attracted to some of the people I've been attracted to. I think that their relationships may have still ended, but would have ended differently. The landscape of the relationship would have been different for sure. No question. No question. They may have even ended sooner. Maybe they would have even lasted longer, ended eventually. Maybe they would have ended on better terms. That's the thing. It's like, you know, I tell people after like a really hard breakup, you have a choice. You can stay the same or you can evolve. And here's what's going to happen. Life wants you to evolve. That's actually like, that is what living is. Living is evolving because anytime you stop evolving, you're really dying. And even if you don't literally die, you feel dead inside. So you have a choice. Stay the same or grow past your ex so that when you run into them in the street a year from now, you're like, I can't believe I ever liked that person. <laughs> yeah. And maybe it's not a year, maybe it's five years, but it's a great feeling when you're like, oh my God, if I had met my ex now, what I, given what I know now, I wouldn't have even been attracted to them. I may have been attracted to them a little bit, right? Because sometimes there's that, like I said, there's that inexplicable connection or that smell and pheromones. But I would have been turned off pretty quickly by some of the things that they said or did. Given given your work, I know that it takes it's very emotionally intensive, right? Between um, the relationship coaching, podcast, social media content, with the, and the content that you post isn't just surface level. It's like deep stuff, and you're in the comments, like engaging with people. How do you protect your own energy? Yeah, it's hard. I have to work hard to prevent burnout. I protect energy a, a number of different ways. Um, I have very strong boundaries. So like in the social media, 
Arena, if anyone is uh, rude to me or any of my followers, they get blocked immediately. If anyone is inappropriate in any way, they're blocked. Uh, I'm doing this seven week course, live course for people in heartbreak. I happen to see some person write in the chat something incredibly rude, like shocking. I kicked her out of the course right then and there, and I made an example of her in front of everyone. So I do not take any. That's one of the ways in which I protect my energy. I had to come to this because what I noticed is that in the beginning of my journey, which I think is really common, is that you know sometimes you have imposter syndrome. You also want to become good at stuff, so you start taking clients that might treat like you notice maybe the some of the tendencies that you had in your romantic relationships you start to have in your work relationships. So I had to learn quickly how to have really strong boundaries. I protect my energy by not by as much as I can possible not scheduling anything in the morning. The morning belongs to me. I protect my energy now. I used to work like, you know, with clients and run things on the weekends. I don't do that anymore. I protect my energy by um well, I I feed my energy by spending time with friends and loved ones so that I am not just one wearing one hat in my life. There's some great ways to protect your energy and feed your energy. And it's, I think it's awesome that you've been able to have strong boundaries to like protect your own peace online and in your courses. Um, and the last question I want to ask you um, kind of goes, it goes back to maintaining a healthy relationship and I think people are all, always kind of looking for like, all right, like, what can I control? Like, what are some things that I can do in my relationship right now or with the person I'm dating to make sure that I do everything I can and not let the the spark burn out? And I know that it's not just going to be like one miraculous thing, but what are some like small things somebody can do regularly to keep to keep the connection going? So to keep the spark alive, take care of yourself. Take care of your body, take care of your mind, fill your cup. Because when you fill your cup, you fill yourself with more energy. The more energy you have, the more, en the more energy you bring and aliveness you bring to the relationship. And that's very attractive. If we, get, if we allow ourselves to get so overburdened by stress, if we allow ourselves to get so overburdened with overgiving, you know, I, was just have, I just had a conversation with a dear friend of mine yesterday. She called me. She, you know, she was like, needed my advice and she's in a, she's in a great marriage, not a perfect marriage, but it's a great marriage. They've been together their whole relationship because they met young, it has been 17 years, so long time. And they're both really big givers. And so one of the, one of the problems, I always say, if you're a giver, find another giver to love, but in order to do that, you have to break the pattern. You have to be able to receive. And so they get stuck in a pattern where they're constantly giving to each other and then they won't give to themselves. And so there's a, too much self-sacrificing. And then all of a sudden it's like, they're not actually like giving to, it's, it's very sexy when you can give to yourself. It's not selfish, it's sexy. That's like one thing that they were, that they, they have been struggling with is like, no, you, you have like, take, take from me. You know, it's like, take for yourself, do this, you're better, right? Another way that people keep the spark alive, and this is really important, this is one of the reasons why the pandemic was so hard on relationships is many partnerships, marriages, they're used to two things and they were used to two things that went away with the pandemic. Number one, hours apart during the day, one person leaving for work, both people leaving for work. Okay. So not being on top of each other all the time. So I do think that, that you need, you can't be together all the time. You need some separateness. Right. And another thing was happening was that everyone was always home and in their sweatpants, stressed out, and no one was in their element shining. We have to be able to see, I'll use like just I'll just paint this picture as a metaphor, but we have to be able to look at our partner from across the room and see them in their element, totally unaware of us and, and us just being a spectator of them really in their element. That is the biggest turn on. And so we have to do the things that are really important. We have couples need to, you know, some couples are like, we really do our best when we travel. We'll travel. You know, they do more of the things that actually is really good for your relationship. 
do more of those things, fill your own cup. And that's how you, that's how you keep the spark, which will dim and reignite and dim and reignite over the years and decades you're together. But that's how you bring it back. You know, when you're constantly, when you're constantly giving to each other or, to, you know, not giving to yourself, you could be, you could wake up one morning and be like, I'm not that attracted to my husband or my wife right now, but then it can turn in a second. As soon as you see them not overly focusing on you, giving to themselves, doing that thing that they do that has nothing to do with you and you're a spectator watching them. That's, that's hot. That's hot. And that's a great way for us to, to end our conversation because things have co come back full circle as you're kind of blending together um, how to the importance of self-care and self-love and also the importance of giving in, in the relationship and doing what you know makes the relationship um, flourish. So Jillian, I wanted to thank you for coming on here. I really wanted to also thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing your heart. Um, if people want to connect with you further, if they want to listen to the podcast, if they want to check out your courses, where's the best place to do that? Well, of course, there's, you know, Instagram at Jillian Tarecki, there's TikTok, and then there's my, like basically Jillian Tarecki, across the board. Um, that's what you'll find my courses, my, my Instagram, and then Jillian, uh, of course, my podcast, Jillian on love. Awesome. Well, I will make sure to include the links to that stuff in the show notes. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. We covered so much today and we chatted about Jillian's personal story and her history um, with relationships. We talked about, um, how she rebuilt herself and, and transformed her, her life, how she transformed her, um, how she transformed her world of relationships. We talked about um, how people can do better in relationships, like what's important when it comes to um, relationships. We talked about the importance of just self-care and self-love and not you know, putting your partner on a pedestal um, and sacrificing your own self-worth and self-care. We covered so much. For, so whatever the takeaway was, make sure to tag Jillian and tag myself because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and we'll see you next time.